Okay, now I have the, the, the great uh, pleasure of, of introducing someone who happens to be not only uh, a board member, um, but a lifelong friend. And so while I could read his bio, and I urge you to do that, it's in, it's in your programs on your table, I'm not going to give you the technical bio, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the person. So I met Frank in 1964. Yep, 64. I have a hard time believing that too. My family moved from West New York, New Jersey uh, to Lyndhurst. And the moving truck moved and was unloading the furniture. And my mom said, hey, there's a guy playing basketball on the street on a hoop that was on a pe telephone pole. Why don't you go make a friend? And I went outside. So Frank was my very first friend that I knew and made uh, in Lyndhurst uh, that long ago. And we are lifelong friends. And so that friendship has blossomed in a number of ways because our, not only is Frank a, like family, he, I call him a big brother, he's my big brother that I didn't have, um, but I've had the honor and the pleasure of learning and watching and being mentored uh, by Frank over the years. And as we sit here today thinking about leadership, and Frank's gonna talk to you a little bit about that about in his career, um, I can tell you that most of what I learned to be a, in, in, in the professional world came from rubbing elbows with people that I sat next, next to at a board table, at the chamber, at, in business settings, and by watching people like Frank. I watched how he dressed, and I'll tell you a great quick story. 1980, Frank and I ran for the Board of Education in Lyndhurst together. And so we jump on a, a political team. We wanted to make a change in, in the education system, so we wanted to get involved. So one day we're gonna go out campaigning, it's a Saturday morning. I was 21 years old, 22, maybe 22 years old. And what did I know? So I, Frank said, we're gonna go walk the neighborhood, we're gonna give out cards, we're gonna ring doorbells and tell people we're gonna solicit votes. My first foray into the, into the election process. Okay, I didn't, have a, I didn't have anything really nice to wear. I didn't, even, I didn't even have a sport coat. My family was of a very, very meager means. And so my dad gave me one of his sport coats. It happened to be green. <laughs> I put it on. Now today, if you wear a green jacket after last weekend, it's really a big deal, right? But, 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 but not at 21 years old. So I put the green jacket on, I, I get dressed, I go outside, Frank comes out of his house right across the street. He looks at me, he goes, what's that? <laughs> so he's like, you, we're not walking the neighborhood in that green jacket. <laughs> he said, go take that off, we gotta do something. I had to go put a sweater on, I had to take the jacket off. So Frank taught me, about, taught, taught me about Dress for Sex. A week later, not even a week later, I had a book called Dress for Success. <laughs> That's a true story. And Frank talked to me about that. And he, and he taught, so you think about mentoring. So he taught me a little bit about becoming a young professional. And I watched him. I watched him how he interacted with people in meetings. I watched him how he interacted in life. And I watched him from afar. Because at one point our lives were together and at one point our lives had separated. Frank was in the NFL, you see by his bio. I was in the hospitality business. And, but, we always, I always watched his career. He was always a great mentor. And I urge those of you that are young professionals in the room to do the same. Pick a few people and, and watch how they operate. Because to this day, Frank and I served together on the board of directors at Glenridge Country Club. And to this day, I continue to learn how to be prepared for your meetings. And, how to, and, and, and I share that with my own team. I pick these tidbits of information up along the way. So what does that really mean? It really means that Frank is a true leader because not only did he do that in his life, but he was willing to share that with me. And he hasn't only done that with me. He, he's got, he's got a, his, uh, his nephew and, and a staff person with him, Tara, here today. He does that with everyone. He touches people and he wants them to be better at what they do and he helps them, and he mentors them, and, and, and provides that kind of guidance. You can't get it any better than that. And so, so Frank is, uh, uh, number one, I know him to be a real mush. He's probably a little bit mushier than me, which I didn't think was possible. Uh, and, uh, and you know, when, when someone's not afraid to shed a tear in front of, in front of an audience, there's something about that that's, that talks about their character, right? 
and, and, that, and that's a fine character. Uh, so, so there isn't anything about uh, Frank Vuno that, that isn't wholesome. And so he's become this great leader of industry, as an entrepreneur of, of nonprofit organizations. He serves on the board at Hackensack Meridian Health and, and countless other boards for, for great things. He gives back to the community. He continues to share and he continues to lead. And frankly, that's what today is all about. And I am, I am absolutely delighted. It was only a, a handful of weeks ago when I, I picked up the phone and said, hey, I really think I'd like you to, to, to talk a little bit about your life story and, and how leadership helped you to grow uh, when you left the NFL and became an entrepreneur and, and where it's taking you today. Would you share that story with this audience? I think it's appropriate uh, for our leadership luncheon. And, and he said, absolutely. So uh, it is my honor and my pleasure to bring up my lifelong friend, a mentor, and a great leader, Mr. Frank Vuno. We accomplished one thing already. First of all, I got to call BS. First, I'll thank you, Jim, for having me here today. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome. This is a great turnout. Um, I have to call a foul on that a little bit because that's not quite the story about how I got invited. Excuse me. Jim brings tears to my eyes. Um, <clears throat> that's really not the story of how I wound up speaking here today. Um, I had to take a little hiatus from the board, uh, the chamber board, for a while. I guess you're required after a certain number of years to take some time off. And I came back to my first board meeting. I sat down at the table. And some people at the table, I said, and I said, Frank, congratulations. I said, about what? They said, uh, this flyer says you're the keynote speaker at the leadership council. <laughs> so I don't quite remember it the way Jim remembers it. But, uh, you know, I can't say next uh, no to my little brother. Anyway, I want to congratulate our honorees today. Um, you've shown some true leadership, uh, as Jim said, not only in your uh, businesses, but in your communities. Um, I, I'll talk to that today a little bit. I also want to pay tribute to uh, Arlene Simpson, who I knew to be a terrific lady. Jim was absolutely right in his description of her and her contributions to this chamber. And I uh, also want to uh, especially congratulate Diane Feinberg for her lifetime of achievement. So uh, thank you. Um, Today, uh, I'll give you a little intro about myself. Uh, hopefully, you, you know, Jim asked me, he said, uh, do you need any audio visual uh, for your speech? And uh, this is my audio visual. So, <laughs> you know, the other day I was putting my speech together and I asked some of my staff, I said, we have any index cards around? They didn't know what that was. <laughs> We didn't have any, so that's funny. <laughs> so I'm really old school, obviously, you can tell. I, I've made my living, I've been blessed, I've made my living in the world of sports. Um, kind of had a dream life, if, uh, if you think about where Jim and I came from, from Meyer Avenue uh, back in Lyndhurst. So uh, it's been a wonderful career, I'm very blessed. I've been fortunate to know the uh, greatest athletes and some of the greatest coaches and leaders in, in all of sports. But uh, I really cut my teeth in the marketing business and um, at a place called Young and Rubicam, an advertising company uh, in New York, which was the largest single, uh, single advertising agency in the country at the time when I came out of school. And a lot of what I was talking to you about today is uh, what I learned from one of my key mentors in that business, as well as from one of my key mentors at the NFL. Now, Jim asked me to speak today because he's heard me tell a lot of stories about my career. And I'm really a better storyteller than I am a speaker, so hopefully you'll bear with me. I'll tell some stories. If I start running a little long, Jim said you got 20 minutes. I said, Jim, you know me. It takes 20 minutes to tell one story. You know? <laughs> so anyway, um, I, I'm also going to talk to you about uh, the theme of our meeting today about leadership and what I think leadership meant. Uh, means I, I've had a lot of incredible uh, mentors in my life. I've seen some really great leaders. You're going to recognize some of the names of the people I've been associated with. And um, I've really learned a lot from them 
uh, about how to motivate people and how to bring people along. One of, one of the proudest things in my career is that there's probably, my partner and I do this all the time, there's par probably about um, 300 or 400 or so people out there that we've uh, hired, we've mentored, we've uh, uh, hired as interns who are now out there that are captains of our industry. And um, the, we're really proud of the fact that not only did we do that and give them a start in their career, but they're incredibly loyal to us. And if we look back on our legacy, my partner Steve Rosner has been my partner for 25 years. If we look back on our legacy, that's one of the things we're most proud of. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that today as well. So I'll tell some stories. I'm also going to give you some insights into what I think uh, makes a good leader. I, I have a lot of books in my office. I read a lot about leadership. I'll talk about some heroes today. But um, this book says uh, has about 64 people in it, and it has a virtue of a leader for all 64. I promise you I'm not going to go through 64 virtues today. I'm going to cut it down to about five or six and tell some stories and anecdotes uh, that I think uh, point to those virtues and those, and those leadership qualities. So first let me start. When we talk about leadership and anything you study, the first major question that people ask is, are leaders born or are they made? So first of all, let me ask, how many people in this room consider themselves a leader? I would have thought a little more, considering this is a leadership conference, but that's a good number. How many of you who just raised your hand think that leaders are born? Wow. So the rest of you think leaders are made. That's an unfair question, because it could be a combination of the two. And I would think that, you know, some of you think that it's a combination of those. But in any case, psychologists... Uh, who have studied this and know a lot more about this stuff than I do think that it's actually a combination of both. One third born, two thirds made. And, and, and to me, I've been asked that question often and I don't have an answer for it. I can't give you that answer today. I, I'm going to ask you to think about that as I talk all, all through my uh, talk today and, and, and think about whether it really comes from an innate quality. You know, it's the whole uh, nature versus, versus nurture uh, argument. But I'll ask you to think about that as I speak today. You know, the reason I'm not sure is when I was really young, probably along the, around the time that uh, Jim moved into the neighborhood, um, I always was motivated. My brothers, I have an older brother, nine years, six years older than me. My parents, they just look at me and ask me, what makes you tick? Like, why are you so obsessed? Why are you so driven? Um, why do you need to get straight A's? And I never had an answer for them. I, I really didn't. I didn't, know, I didn't know what that was all about. Um, I just was. So uh, there's a little of me that really thinks that, you know, you're kind of born with that. And I was blessed to, to just have that quality. I always wanted to be the first one picked. Uh, I always wanted to be captain of the team. Uh, and frankly, I wanted to do the picking ultimately. <laughs> so anyway, that was uh, that, growing up. That was the, I had that thought from very early age. Um, when you dig deeper into the research, the trait that people that psychologists say people are born with is that you're an extrovert. So. For those, there weren't that many people that thought you were born with this trait, but I thought this would go over a lot better. But if, you, if you're thinking about what you're born with, think about, and you're a leader, think about whether you're an extrovert or an introvert. Now, I don't really even agree with that, because, yeah, I'm pretty extroverted. <laughs> but um, I know a lot of great leaders, and I'm going to talk about a couple today, who are, intro, who are really quiet leaders. And uh, you'll recognize the names when I get to talk about them. So I consulted a couple of the quote books, and I looked at some great sports leaders to figure out uh, what do they say about born versus made in terms of leadership. And I went to the great Vince Lombardi, and Vince said, leaders are made, they are not born. They are made by hard effort, which is the price of which all of us must pay to achieve any goal that is worthwhile. He was talking about the need to give maximum effort and to work hard for success. Another thought, on board versus made from another one of my idols, 
and that's Walt Disney. Walt Disney says, it seems to me shallow and arrogant for any men in these times to claim he is self-made, that he owes all of his success to his own unaided efforts. Many hands and hearts and minds generally contribute to anyone's notable achievements. There's two pretty good heavyweights weighing in on made versus born. Excuse me. So, thinking about that, I'm going to take a few shots at the key traits, uh, Vuno key traits of being a leader, I guess. Um, I think they're very simple things when you boil it all down. It's amazing to me that these simple truths that really are key to not only success as a leader, but success as, as just a family man and, and, as, and in life in general. I think it all boils down to this. The first is honesty and to always tell the truth. And uh, my dad was a guy who, who told me that from a very young age, and that stuck with me. He said, uh, always tell the truth and you'll never have to worry about what you told to whom. And that, that stuck with me, and I'll give you a few examples of that in my career. Uh, later on in life, when I went to the book of quotes and I was talking to people about leadership, uh, I found a quote by one of uh, the guys I, my, I admire most, Abe Lincoln. And it, this was awesome because this quote was a lot like what my father told me. And I don't think my father ever read a book of quotes on Abe Lincoln. So. <laughs> Abe Lincoln said, no man has a good enough memory to make a successful liar. <laughs> I think that's awesome. So I think that honesty creates a foundation of, of fairness and openness in any organization. And I think that's rule number one for being a great leader. I've learned that from dealing in my own life with professional athletes and, and NFL owners. You want, you want to deal with people who have a problem with the truth. <laughs> you know, when faced with a moral dilemma, uh, my partner and I, uh, we've, always, we've always told the truth. When you boil it all down, believe me, it gets hard. Don't you wish, like, somebody out there would just take uh, OBJ and the Giants and just sit them down and say, get your act together? Really? But, you know, probably the same with our president, right? Don't you want somebody to tell them, you know, hey, this is the truth, you know? Somebody out there... <laughs> Let these guys know that they should be speaking the truth. But anyway, even if it means you might lose the client or get fired in my lifetime, in my career, by athletes as well as owners, and it's come down to that a lot of times, we ultimately decided on the truth. And I think that this lets everyone in your company know what you stand for. You really have moral courage. And I think that that's uh, absolute truth uh, for being a great leader. The second, second trait is a work ethic, to lead by example. Now, I'm having a problem with millennials these days, I gotta tell you. <laughs> the, uh, I don't know if, if anybody has hints here on how to work that out, tell me. So I, I, I need to learn. Because the first, the first 90 days when I got out of school, I worked for a company called Young and Rubicam, I mentioned earlier. The first 90 days out of school, I worked every single day, Saturday and Sunday included. And at the time in the agency business, there was a saying, if you don't come in Saturday, don't come in Monday. <laughs> at y &R, it was, if you don't come in Saturday, don't come in Sunday. So could you imagine telling somebody today when you first hire them, I expect you to be here morning, noon, and night for 90 days straight? I don't know. I don't think they'll take the job. But, uh, but that was back then. Anyway, speaking of Sundays, when I got to the NFL, I worked for the NFL business unit, which was called NFL Properties. We were a separate, separate division of the NFL. And we were responsible for all the commercial aspects of, of the NFL including managing all their intellectual property. To this day, all of the teams in the league put all of the, the management of their intellectual property into a trust, and the league runs and manages that trust. I was responsible for running that. And when I first got to the NFL, uh, because of Sundays and because of my work ethic at Young and Rubicamp, 
I went in on Sundays uh, to get ahead of the week and to, to uh, be prepared for what was coming up that week. And I was at work one day and my wife called me up, which is really rare. She rarely calls me at work. And she said, you know, I was just at the grocery store and I saw one of the people in your office at the grocery store. And this is a Sunday afternoon during football season. And she said, I, I said to him, hey, what are you doing at the grocery store? Why aren't you watching the games? And he said to me, oh, I never watch the games. I'm really not a big NFL fan. <laughs> True story. So, you know, shock to me. I had dreamed my whole life at a job at working at the NFL offices, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, we have people working here who don't watch the games? I went crazy. I went and I gutted the entire conference room. I put screens in. Back then, there was no satellite TV, but we could take the, the back feed from the networks because we were the league and we owned the broadcast. We could put all of the games that were on on a Sunday afternoon on at once on all the television screens. So I had multiple television screens installed, and I, and I put them all on a wall in our conference room. And I started telling everybody, how the hell could we sell the NFL? How could we make it popular with people? How could, we, um, how could we tell them they should be buying our products or should be sponsors of our league if we don't know our, our game better than they do? And, and how are we going to keep up with what's going on out there? What are the people wearing to the stadiums? What are the coaches wearing? What are the players wearing? That was my first responsibility at NFL, to, to manage what was on the fields. I said, if we don't watch games, how do we know what's going on in the fields? Soon, one person would come, two people would come. I think Peter Hughes is in this office. He was one of those, in this room, he was one of those people. People, uh, Peter will verify this. Suddenly, we had uh, everybody come on Sundays. And uh, we turned it into a party. We turned it into a, a bonding experience. Everybody enjoyed watching the games. And it became a real, a real uh, bonding and, and, and teamwork exercise for us. But if, you're not, if you don't have the work ethic, uh, and you're not there setting, leading by example. If I was demanding people to be there and I wasn't be there, I don't think it would have went over so big. But I think that's a big important part of being a leader. I want to talk about a couple of other people who had great work ethic. And I'm looking at the room, so I think that most of you will remember these names. But uh, these are some athletes who I've had the pleasure of getting, getting to know and uh, who had incredible work ethic. Uh, first was Walter Payton. People know Walter Payton probably is arguably one of the, the greatest running back in the NFL. It's arguable, but certainly one of the top. He had the record for yardage for many years. You, you ever realize what size Walter Payton was? Walter Payton was five foot 10 and 200 pounds. For, for, for those of you who are football fans and you think about it today, uh, that's really tiny. Walter Payne was at, out of Jackson State College, a, a historically black college that most people never heard of. So he had to overcome a lot to make it in the NFL. And for him to ultimately become one of the greatest running backs of all time was an incredible accomplishment. But if you know about Walter Payne's training, you know why he was successful. I, I, I urge you after today to Google Walter Payton and the Hill, and uh, see how he worked out and how he trained. He used to run up a straight hill constantly, uh, was incredibly dedicated to, to, uh, to his craft, and a great, great person, and a great leader. Uh, the Chicago Bears won the world championships on the back of Walter, uh, championship in 1985 on the back of Walter Payton, and he was one of the hardest workers I've ever seen. He was also one of the greatest athletes I've ever seen. My first Pro Bowl in 1986, the Bears had just won the world championship. I go out to Hawaii, I'm on the field. Three days in a row, Walter came out and challenged one of the position players. He took the quarterbacks on, asked them how far they could throw, and he out threw the quarterbacks. He took a kicker on the next day, said, how, could you, how far could you kick a field goal? Out kicked the kickers. The next day, he did the same with the punters. One of the greatest athletes I've ever seen. So if you can go, when you go home, Google Walter Payton. And what he said about training and his work ethic, he said, you're going to take this wrong. So somebody asked him, what are you thinking about when you're training? You're gonna, he said, you're going to take this wrong. I try to kill myself. 
talk about work ethic. Uh, Jerry Rice, maybe, maybe absolutely the greatest receiver of all time in the NFL, maybe the greatest player of all time in the NFL, another, another incredible gentleman. But you know what, again, football fans, you know what Jerry Rice's 40 time was? 4-7. Linemen run that today. Quarterbacks run that today. If, he ran, if a wide receiver ran a 4-7 at the combine today, they'd never get picked. They'd never make it in the NFL. Jerry Rice, greater receiver of all time, 4-7-40. So he knew that he had to work uh, to make it in the NFL. He came out of Mississippi Valley College, another historically black college, not a football powerhouse. So he knew he was up against all obstacles. And Jerry was an incredible leader. The people on his team marveled at his work ethic. When he caught a pass, he sprinted to the end zone every single time he caught a pass in practice. And he'd work out in the offseason six days a week. People have tried to copy this workout and, and package it and sell it, literally. He used, to, he used to do cardiovascular training before there was such a thing. He'd, uh, he'd, he'd run uphill sprints like Walter Payton up a steep hill. He'd weight train. This was long before these guys were doing that kind of training. When Jerry Rice started, the, most guys were probably drinking beer in a locker room and smoking cigarettes. So he was, he was a guy that was long before his time, had incredible work ethic, overcame obstacles to make himself one of the greatest of all time. And lastly, uh, I think you know this guy too, Michael Jordan. You know, when Michael Jordan came out of North Carolina to the NBA, he couldn't shoot. He, he was a horrible jump shooter. But nobody worked harder than Michael Jordan. These are the things that people don't realize. They just think these guys are great athletes and it comes naturally. You know, Michael Jordan used to host practice, used to have a practice at his house. He had a court at his house. And he'd practice all day long before he went to practice in the arena for the official practices. And ultimately, Scottie Pippen, another Hall of Famer who was on his team, joined him at his house. And eventually, his entire team joined him at his house. So the Chicago Bulls used to practice at Michael Jordan's house before they went to the arena to, to do their official workouts. Could you imagine what the Players Association would say about that today? <laughs> True story. They went out to win six world championships. So you talk about work ethic, right? Those are great leaders. That's great work ethic. And uh, I got to know these guys along my way. Um, and I could tell you, this is the other thing I talked about, extrovert versus introvert. Those are three introverts. I know you might not think that about Michael Jordan, but Jerry Rice, Walter Payne, did you ever actually hear them speak? They're the quietest, highest pitched voices you've ever heard, uh, led by example. So I don't know about that extrovert, invert, introvert thing. I might disagree with a couple of psychologists about that. So for all of you who are introverts in the room, there's still hope. <laughs> the third key trait of a leader, I think, is vision. And I think that, that includes goal setting. And uh, a couple of stories from my own personal experience. Well, one of my good friends, uh, besides Jim growing up, tells his story and makes a lot of people laugh. Uh, there was a roast in town. Um, uh, they wanted to raise money, so they wanted to pick on me. And my buddy got up and he told this story. I, I never really recalled it, but he said, um, he said, you know, do you guys remember right here down the road where the stadium is now, the, before, before there was a stadium, there was a place called Sportland. And it was a pitch and putt, it was a batting cage, putt-putt course, and, uh, you know, we didn't have much money. We used to walk there, and um, the owner uh, back then, we didn't call it the Meadowlands, with all due respect, we called it the Swamp. Um, <laughs> you know, there were miles high piles of garbage back then. Everybody forgets that, thank God. You guys have done such a great job. But we used to, we used to walk there, and we didn't have any money. And the owner used to have us go out uh, in the driving range, and he'd have us go pick up the golf balls out of the mud. And, and we had little sticks with a little basket on it. We picked the golf balls up. We had to wear football helmets and shoulder pads because the guys driving the ball would all try to hit us. <laughs> so we'd get, the, we'd get the tokens. He'd give us the tokens to go in the batting cage. Uh, none of us played golf back then. Yeah. 
who knew what golf was. But in, in any case, my buddy tells a story that we're walking there one night, we come over the hill in Lyndhurst, and we're looking out over these swamps and garbage and looking at Manhattan, and he said, uh, we were about 12 years old, he says, you know, and my buddy Frank says, hey, hey, H, look out here. This has got to be the most valuable land in the world. Think about this. So close to New York City. Imagine this, what this might be someday. This could be incredible. And he says, he turned and he goes, uh, duh, yeah, I guess so. Can we go now? You know, so <laughs> he said, he said, uh, he said, Frank had this vision. And again, I go back to, you know, what made me say that? How do you learn that at 10 or 12 years old? I'm not really sure, but uh, it came pretty natural to me. And I, and I feel incredibly blessed about that. To have seen what actually has happened here uh, makes me so proud to be part of the community, uh, to see what we've done with what used to be what we call the swamp, where we used to go rat hunting. Um, when I interviewed at the NFL, another uh, experience about vision, um, I don't know if it was smart or not, but I spent the whole day during interviews. Uh, again, uh, the company marketed all the products, all the, all the products you see with the team names on them and so on. And at night, after a whole day of interviews, we go out to dinner. And the bosses are sitting there, and now they're going to pose some you know, real questions to get to know me before they hire me. They go, so Frank, what do you think? What do you think about our business? I said, I don't know. You know, I, I think it could be at least three times as big as you are now. I, I, I didn't realize I might have been insulting a lot of people by saying that, the guys who were working there. It's not a really good thing necessarily to say to the guys that have been running the company for a while. But in any case, they looked at me and they said, oh, you're crazy. We think we're doing all that we can. And I proceeded to lay out what I thought, a vision for what I thought the place could be. So they did luckily eventually hire me. And uh, in seven and a half years that I was there, we grew the business over eight times. So it was more than three times as big. It was eight times as big when I left, eight, uh, seven and a half years later. So uh, I had a little feeling for what that could be. In any case, um, while I was there, I got to meet one of the mentors of mine who was really, really a great uh, leader. And it's really a shame that today this person is not in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. The fact that you know, owners like Jerry Jones are in the Hall of Fame, and that Paul Tagliabue, the former commissioner, is not in the Hall of Fame is a real shame. So if any of you are sports writers out there, or anybody know anybody that gets a vote for who should be in the Hall of Fame of the NFL, Paul Tagliabue should be. And I'll tell you two stories why, and I'll talk about vision in, the, in that context. First off, when, uh, when I left the NFL, again, we didn't report to the commissioner's office. We reported to an independent group of owners but Paul did an exit interview with me anyway, because we had become friends. And I had a lot to do with what was actually on the field at the NFL, so I dealt a lot with the league office. So Paul sat me down and he said, listen, as you're leaving, I don't know exactly what you're going to get into to build your own company, he said, but he said, we're going to need help. If you think back, this was only 1993, and NFL teams played in old baseball stadiums. And for the most part, the owners in the NFL just rented their fields. In a lot of cases, they weren't even the primary tenant. They were the secondary tenant. Baseball teams were the, were the primary tenant. So what did that mean? When you went to a game, you might be sitting off in what was uh, center field of a baseball stadium, but now you're miles from the football field. So your experience and your sight lines watching a football game at a baseball stadium were just horrible. And the experience really wasn't so great. But Paul knew that in order to be competitive with television becoming more and more important part of the game, that you could sit at home and watch the TV, the TV football on TV uh, and be more comfortable perhaps than being at one of these old rickety stadiums. He said, we got to improve the fan experience. We ultimately have to have owners take over the ownership of stadiums and build their own stadiums. And he said, I'm going to change the way the ticket revenue is shared and I'm gonna incentivize people to build suites and club seats and keep that revenue so they can finance stadiums. And he said, I think you can help our owners. 
if you go out there because of what you know about marketing and you help them raise the sponsorship dollars and the, and the merchandising revenue and the ticket sales and so on, we'll be able to build new stadiums. So Paul led me a lot to, the, to the, the owners around the NFL and introduced me as somebody that can help them own their own stadiums. And subsequently, I helped with uh, probably more than half the, the owners in the NFL to get their new stadiums built. And that was all because of Paul's vision. The second, the second thing about Paul, uh, and why I think he's just a total Hall of Famer, was uh, right after Katrina hit in New Orleans, um, I got a phone call from the then Lieutenant Commissioner, which is Roger Goodell, who's the commissioner now. Roger and I go back to uh, his intern days when I was at the NFL. And, uh, you know, I answered like a wise guy said, somebody said, Roger Goodell's on the phone. I, I answered like a wise guy said, to what do I owe this honor? And he said, I don't know if you're going to think this is an honor or not, but we need you to fly down to New Orleans with us tomorrow. We're going down for our first visit of what happened down there. And when we got, went down there, it was incredible. The business leaders we met with said, think about this. Um, they said, if the Superdome goes dark and the Saints don't come to the Superdome, everybody's going to think New Orleans is dead. And in my second trip, uh, on my way back down there, when we set up offices down there to work to keep the Saints in New Orleans, I, I saw a, a magazine cover that said, America, the United States has never lost a city. Will New Orleans be the first? Think about that. Think about a city just totally disappearing in the United States of America. It was critical that the stadium get open. So on our visit, we go to the floor of what was an absolute devastated wreck of a place, the, the New Orleans Superdome, once the, one of the wonders of the world, now totally in disrepair from what had happened during Katrina, and I won't go into the atrocities that happened down there. It's got a big hole in the roof. The place is destroyed, torn apart. The floor is all ripped up. We're standing on concrete. It's December. Paul Tagliabue says to the people that run the, the place, I need this to open for next football season. And they said, Paul, that's just impossible. He said, I, I don't take that as an answer. He said, what if I get all the NFL owners to donate money to get to jumpstart this? And I said, well, that would be a big help because it's going to be a while before the FEMA money comes rolling in. He goes, I'll do it. If you give me your commitment that we'll get this open for the beginning of the football season in September, I'll get NFL owners to chip in and give millions of dollars to get this started. And he did. He got every owner in the NFL to put a million dollars up to get the construction of New Orleans uh, Superdome done. And we opened that stadium the third week in September to, you know, one of the greatest moments actually in my sports career, and certainly I think in American history, really. There were people outside the Superdome six hours before it opened, all the people in New Orleans crying with, joy, with tears of joy. It was an incredible experience. And that was really all due to the vision and the perseverance of Paul Tagliabue. Great story. True leader. Another guy who was a leader with a lot of vision was the chairman and CEO of Young and Rubicam, a fellow by the name of Ed Ney. Ed, uh, Ed was one of my idols. Uh, there's some really funny stories of me with Ed. I'll tell you a couple, but he was one of my mentors as well. Now, I was a really lowly assistant account executive. He's the chairman of the company. And um, in, in terms of his vision, uh, back then, this wasn't commonplace. He came up with an idea that he called the whole egg. Think about an egg for a second. And he envisioned all of the disciplines of marketing communications coming together under one roof. So he proceeded to buy agencies and public relations and direct marketing and branding. And he put them all together under the YNR roof so that all the communications from an organization would be, would be uh, uh, on target, on strategy, and coordinated. It was long before its time. Nobody had ever done that before because all of these agencies had their independent brands. So, uh, so Ed had an incredible vision and was, and was an incredible leader who inspired me. The fourth, uh, fourth trait, I think, of good leaders is passion, to love what you do and have a uh, generous spirit. And I think that uh, you know the old Confucius proverb, choose a job you love and you uh, will never have to work a day in your life. Um, I think an example of that is Tom Brady. Um, 
yesterday I was working out and I heard on the television on the cardio machine, you know, uh, Giselle is worth $300 million herself. Why would Tom Brady want to play football? It all gets down to passion. The guy loves the game. He's an incredible, if you know his work ethic, if you know his training methods, you know what he eats, you know how he takes care of his body. He's 41 years old and leading his team to Super Bowls, and he still goes out there year after year, takes a beating, and just keeps going out there. Why? Because he has a passion for the game. The guys on his team will follow Tom Brady anywhere he wants to go. He's a true leader, and he has passion. There's a compliment to having passion, and that's having a generous spirit. And by that, I mean treating everyone, even the little guy, with respect. Um, I can tell you many a story about that, but I'll tell you about Ed Ney again real quickly. Uh, he was known to walk the building. He knew everybody's name. He knew the shoe shine guy. He knew, he knew everybody at the building treated everybody equally. The funny story about that for me is I didn't know that the very first day when you're on the job, the chairman of the organization of thousands of people comes and welcomes you on your first day. Well, the first day I was on the job, my client, who I had just gotten to know, took me out to a place called The Palm, which I had never heard of, and got me absolutely obliterated. <laughs> so I went back to my office. He, went, he flew on to a meeting in Chicago. I fell asleep at my desk. I was drooling on myself. About 6.30 at night, some guy is waking me up, and Ed Nay was like the godfather. He had something wrong with his throat, and he spoke like this. So somebody's waking me up, Frank, Frank. And I'm like, leave me alone. <laughs> it was Ed Nay coming to welcome me on my first day. He subsequently got me a ride home in a, in a, in a car, said, you're going to need a ride home. Uh, he didn't fire me. He knew I was out with the client, thank God. But uh, for a CEO of a company to come welcome everybody on the first day, I think it's incredible. So I think that shows a generosity of spirit. He also, by the way, there's another whole story. Jimmy's giving me a high sign. Uh, he bought me my first two pair of business shoes. Um, it's a real funny story. I'll tell you offline, but uh, uh, I was wearing gray patent leather shoes because I thought they matched my gray suit. You know, at the time, that was the only pair of shoes I had. He told me, get rid of those shoes, go downstairs and tell them to put it on Ed Nay's account, which is really incredible. Newt Rockney had a great quote about uh, how every player on a team is important. An automobile goes nowhere efficiently unless it has a quick, hot spark to ignite things, to set the cogs of the, mo of the mo machine in motion. So I try to make every player on my team feel he's the spark keeping our machine in motion. On him depends our success. That's all about teamwork. That's all about treating the little guy with importance. A couple of last things. One is confidence and fearlessness. I think confident, with confidence, you have to have humility. I think true leaders have confidence, but they realize the point at which Confidence becomes hubris. Uh, I think you can be confident but not cocky. And fearless, fearlessness, I think you need to have uh, the confidence to be able to take a risk. You know, it wasn't so easy uh, when I was working at the NFL for me to just walk from there and to go uh, start my own agency. You know, when I told my family they were aghast, uh, not only my dad and my brothers, but uh, my kids, they were just small at the time, and I said, Dad, does this mean we're not going to be able to stay in suites when we go to hotels? <laughs> not too spoiled, right? Um, I'm going to skip a few things so that I don't go on too long. Lastly, I'm going to talk to you a lot about what today is all about, and that's uh, uh, giving back and doing community service. And I learned from my parents, this is something I definitely learned, that it's far better to give than to receive. And so to me, um, great leaders serve their communities, not only in, in their companies, but in organizations. That drives me to do the things I do, as Jim mentioned earlier, for the hospital and uh, the network and for uh, uh, my university where I came from and for the club I belong to and so on. Um, and another one of my idols, Winston Churchill said, uh, the price of greatness is responsibility. The price of greatness is responsibility. And I, I really believe that. Uh, you know, he also said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. And I think that's uh, 
uh, a real good thing to remember for today as we honor uh, all these leaders today. So um, lastly, I'll leave you with this. I really believe that this is true. All great leaders get intrinsic wealth derived from personal achievement and commitment to a worthy cause. I know that's true for me. I hope it's true for you. Thanks. Thank you.